Okay. So today, Richard II and Henry IV. And like every Monday, I'd like to hear what kind of star rating you give these kings as we go through. Um, now, before we properly kick off with Richard, we do need to talk a little bit about what it's like to actually live as a normal person, an average Joe or Josephine, in uh, these medieval times. As you notice here, our dates for Richard II are 1377 to 1399, so we're talking the 14th century. Um, it is a difficult time, and in fact it has been since all, well, with all the kings that we've spoken about, from William the Conqueror onwards, it's not been ideal to be a peasant living in England. Um, the life of a peasant is pretty dull. Um, well, maybe not dull, maybe repetitive is a better way of putting it. Um, the vast majority of, um, uh, of people in England, and we're talking in the time of William the Conqueror, about a million people. Um, by this time, we're probably looking at a few more, but not that many more, to be honest. So let's say there's around a million peasants in England during this time. These people, they spend all of their time doing agriculture. They are planting crops. They are plowing fields. Not in that order. Um, they are... The, the children in peasant families would spend about two months of the year just running around in the field scaring away the birds. You know, human scarecrows, that's your job. Pick up the weeds, scare the birds. Do that for two months to save the seeds. Um, there would then, once you've plowed and planted and kept the weeds away and the birds away, you'd then have to harvest it all. Um, <laughs> uh, Rock is asking, did Richard die on the toilets? No, a slow and painful death for Richard, I'm afraid. Not a pooey death like most of them. Oh, good question, <laughs> Alaya. Um, agriculture is farming. So people would have had um, a little patch of land at the back of their house, um, which would have been not for most people. For most people, it wouldn't have belonged to them. They would be have a very small garden for themselves. Then they'd have a plot of land that would belong to the local lord. Now, the lord would have complete control over you. We mentioned this, I think, when we talked about William the First, but you wouldn't be allowed to leave your village um, to go visiting someone else. You wouldn't be able to go and get married without permission from the Lord. Um, you wouldn't be able to go and just take what you want from the local forest, go hunting. Um, and you've got to work for most of your time for the Lord and give him all the food that you create or, or all the money that comes from that food. You can't just, you know, have it for yourself. You might have your own little carrot patch or something, but that's about as good as it's going to get. Um, you'd also share a load of animals with everyone else in your village. So you might have a bit of woodland where you keep pigs. You might have uh, a meadow where you keep some cows and sheep, maybe. Um, but that's about it. And you're going to spend all spring getting the plants ready, all summer making sure they're not eaten, all autumn harvesting those things, and then all winter you're going to spend fixing your house, um, preserving food for the winter, because of course you can't grow in the winter times. You're going to be making things like rope and tools. Um, you're going to be gathering firewood. Uh, and, it, and then once you've got around the whole year, of course, spring comes again and you've got to start again. So peasants have a hard time. Um, and that's going to be important when we talk about Richard II. We've got, to, we've got to keep that in the back of our mind. Now, during this hard life that the peasants are leading, they also have to pay taxes. They have to pay money to their local lord, who in turn takes that money and gives it to um, uh, the king, essentially. I mean, there's a bit more complicated than that, but that's essentially what we're doing. Um, but you've, it's really difficult. You're scribbling, you're scrimping and saving, and you're giving all that money to the Lord every year, and you don't really get much in return. The idea is that you should get some kind of defense in return, you know. Uh, th those taxes are going to pay the army so that they can defend against you know, whatever enemies there are. During this time period, of course, we are right in the middle of the Hundred Years' War. So there's a war going on. Um, 
And so you need to keep giving money for the king to be able to do that. Um, Richard II, though, is going to use his money a bit differently than other kings, which is going to cause some problems. Hmm. Now, uh, I've got lots of questions um, here in the chat. Let me just sort of rewind. Um, oh, OK. So how old do you have to be to, to be a lord? That's a good question. And there is no real age limit. Assuming that your father was a lord and he's now dead, you are the lord. So you could have child lords for sure. Um, yeah, there's no age limit. It's not a job that you get because you're good at stuff. It's a job that you get because your father had it and his father had it and et cetera, et cetera. So yes, it's, you, you can't may have a job interview to become a lord. You just are one or you aren't one. Um, you can definitely upset the king and have your lordship taken away, but it's very difficult to actually become one. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, so you can't really become a lord. You just have to be born into it. And there, there are some stories from earlier history where maybe a particularly bold peasant gets knighted and then will become a lord. But that became rarer and rarer as history went on, to be honest. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, where do they get their money from? That's a good question, Amelia and Benjamin. So peasants would get their money from the crops that they grow or the animals that they feed and things. They would then take them to market and then they would get paid money for them. Or if you're just working directly for the Lord, you just give all your food to the Lord and then he takes money out of it and you know ticks you off the list of having paid your taxes. You might not actually see the money yourself, you see. Um, why are they called peasants? I don't know where that word comes from. Maybe if uh, somebody out there can have a look at the etymology, which, in, which means the history of a word. If you type into Google etymology of peasants, you might be able to find the answer there for me. Um, uh, oh, and uh, Grace has got a big uh, veg patch at her papa's house. That's very cool. Huh. Oh, dear. We're already giving away star ratings. No, Richard's going to be fine. Maybe. <laughs> you could be free and be a lord, yes. If you were a very young lord, like a toddler lord, like we had toddler kings, um, that just means that there will be other people to sort of do the thinky stuff for you. Um, but they'll do it in your name. And as soon as you reach a, uh, an old enough age, so probably about 16, but you know that's not set in stone, then you could take over and be uh, lord yourself. You know? But then, you know, there are examples of younger people being lord. Yeah. Um, Ah, can a girl be a lord? So a girl who would not be a lord, but they would be a lady. So um, you would have a lord of the manor and a lady of the manor if they were married. And in some cases, the lady was more powerful than, lord, than the lord. But officially, on paper, it was the lord that had the power. That doesn't mean there weren't some very powerful ladies, though. Okay. I think I'm called up. Uh, what does the lady do? That's a good question. The lady of a manor would, well, pretty much swan around with the Lord. She'd be uh, sort of her official job would be to have royal children or not royal children, lordly children, uh, posh children who would then take over. Um, but in the but in practice, the ladies would be doing a lot. They would be writing a lot of letters. Uh, they would be uh, communicating with each other and with other lords. They'd be sorting out good marriages. Uh, they'd be making sure that you know the lord is focused on what he's supposed to be doing. And you know it depends on the on the lady and the lord in question. I'm sure in some relationships the lady was far more powerful, and in others the lords took the lead. Mm. Um, ah, well, we're, we're, I've just been asked, is Richard II good or bad? That's for you to decide. So let's start with him. Now we know a little bit about what the peasants are doing and the lords. Now we'll have a look at Richard and where he fits into that. Okay. So the first thing we need to know about Richard is that he was a child king. He became king at the ripe old age of 10 years old. Ooh. So, yeah, not very old at all, um, which means just like someone was just asking about the lords there. That means that he's going to have to have a group of lords who kind of make the big decisions with him, or at least help him make the decisions. At 10 years old, running a country might be seen as a little bit tricky, just a little bit hard for your average 10-year-old. But this doesn't mean that Richard just sort of sat back and let other people do stuff. He was quite interested from the get-go. 
you know, he's now king of a country that is at war with France. Um, he's got uh, problems over there. He also needs to make sure that everyone in his country are happy, of course, because during times of war, people tend to get kind of angry. Yeah, they kind of get grumpy because everything's difficult when a country is at war. And that means they're more likely to get angry at their own king as well. So he's got to keep the people happy. Oh, here we are. Look, uh, Rebecca is telling me that um, Latin, uh, so pages from Latin with pay from French equals peasant. There you are. Hmm, I like it. So like a page pay. Oui, oui. Um, Okay, so we've got a 10-year-old king. He's trying to look after the country the best he can, maybe. Um, and by the time he's 14, he's already got a serious problem on his hands because a couple of troublemakers ooh, from down in Essex ooh, will start to make life hard for the king. These two men, their names are John Bull, who is a priest who has been going around spreading all kinds of terrible, terrible rumours. He keeps making speeches about how people should be free and how people shouldn't have to just do what the Lord says and how Jesus would have said that everyone is equal. Ooh, that kind of stuff is going to get you in trouble in medieval England, for sure. So John Bull is taken and put in prison. Clink. Um, Stop talking to people about our, about equality. Get in that prison and stay there. Now, um, oh, a good question here from Regina. What if the ladies don't marry? Um, well, unfortunately, back in medieval times, the ladies wouldn't really have much of a choice. Um, you don't choose who you marry if you're, a, if you're a noble. You get told who you're marrying by your parents. And so they'd marry whoever was most convenient for the family, whoever could bring the most money or power. And yes, you wouldn't have a choice, I'm afraid. That's a very modern idea. Um, the peasants would have more of a choice, but not the posh people. No, you, you just, uh, what if you can't get pregnant? Um, that would be tricky too, I suppose, um, because it's important to have heirs um, as the lady. So you might find that you are um, cast off in for, in, in for the, to be replaced with another woman, unfortunately. It was not a very fair or even time for, for women back in the medieval period. Um, yeah. What if you didn't have a mum or dad? That's a good question. I suppose you would just be, live as a peasant. Maybe you'd be lucky enough in this period to uh, go and either live in a monastery, so maybe the, the monks and the nuns would look after you. They had, they had orphanages. Some of the towns would have had something like orphanages, but more often than not, I suppose orphans would be taken in as apprentices to craftsmen, maybe, where they would be taught how to be a carpenter or a farrier or a blacksmith or something um that could be it but i don't know if there's a specific path for all orphans at this point um I, i'm sure many of them would just go and live with extended family instead good question though i like that mm, yes all right so john ball he's talking about equality and how it's unfair to just do what the king and the lords say and he's put in prison what tyler he starts to lead a huge group of peasants we're talking of thousands of them by the end in something that we call the peasants revolt now what tyler is a man who must have been very charismatic um he wasn't a priest he was just a normal guy really um and he and the other peasants uh, or a lot of other peasants down in essex got really really angry um they were angry because the taxes were just too high. Um, some people link this back to the plague, the Black Death that we mentioned last time, because during the Black Death, about a third of the people of Britain or England died, which meant that there was now a lot more, there were a lot more empty fields around. And the peasants, they very much wanted to farm that. You know? They wanted to you know, be paid more money and have more land. But the, the royalty and the nobles would say, no, you can't have more land because you'll get ideas above your station. So the peasants start to get angrier and angrier. During this time, uh, England is at war with France, which means that Richard, the young king, is upping the taxes and upping the taxes, a bit like King John did when uh, Richard was away in crusades. And so the peasants are having to pay more and more money, and they're listening to people like John Bull talking to them about equality, and eventually they've had enough. They start rioting and running amok. They spread out through Essex, 
first a few hundred and then a few thousand. They, they even go so far as to burn down some noblemen's posh houses. Um, and eventually there's enough of them. Uh, about 60,000, I think, is the number that uh, some historians bandy about. Um, there's enough of them to march on to London. Can you imagine it? A huge horde of peasants with their pitchforks and their uh, scythes, you know, those things that you use to cut down grain. Uh, maybe the odd spade. I like to think at least one of them sharpened a turnip to a particularly vicious point. Hmm. And they're all marching on London, shouting and hollering, burning things as they go. Oh, what are pitchforks? Pitchforks are like, um, uh, like a big, uh, like a giant fork you know, that you use to like chuck hay around. Yeah. Mm. Um, <laughs> so we've got our pitchforks out, and they all riot along from Essex up to London. And the king realizes, young King Richard, that he needs to sort this out. Now, their leader Tyler, what Tyler, as uh, spelt here, yeah, what Tyler. Um, he is somebody who's, you know, he's, he's, he must be very brave because he's the, the face of this rebellion. And everyone knows that if you're in charge of the rebellion and the rebellion fails, then you are going to be dead. So what Tyler is very brave in this case, he's leading these peasants all the way to London. Now, when they get there, they, the huge peasant army, if you like, they wait on one side of the river and the king comes out on a boat, a little floating platform. Um, <laughs> good morning. Um, and it floats out onto the river. And he kind of stands there in the middle of the river, so he can't be hurt. I mean, some of these peasants have bows and arrows, but they're not interested in killing the king. Um, and the king has a discussion with them. He says, look, how about everyone just calms down and put your pitchforks away? How about we all just be friends? I'll agree to lower the taxes. You good people, smelly people, go home and start farming again. Everything will be fine. Hmm. Although he would have said all that in French, of course. Um, which I cannot do. Yeah, go on, uh, go do your diggy diggy pitchy fork, uh -huh -huh, is what he would have said. Now, everything's going fine. What Tyler um, is talking back to the king, they seem to be coming to some kind of agreement. But as this is happening, unbeknownst to what Tyler or the king, at this exact moment, there is a group of naughty peasants who have attacked the Tower of London. They run into the Tower of London. They stab to death uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Ooh, they stab to death the Chancellor of England. Ooh, who's the guy who like works with all the money and is in charge of the taxes? He's dead. And so, of course, when the king gets back to his castle thinking, yeah, we've made peace here, he finds out that two of his best mates are dead and that the peasants are running amok in his tower. And then things start to get a bit more ugly. Now, things could have got much more ugly. There could have been a full-scale war. You know, we could have had the, the soldiers marching out of London and attacking the peasants, but it doesn't get to that point because Richard, he comes back and he has another discussion, this time in person with Watt Tyler. And he says, look, what's going on? And Watt Tyler apologizes and says, oh, I, I don't know. It wasn't me who sent those guys to your tower. Sorry about that. How about we uh, start again? But this is where sources divide. Ooh. Trying to work out what happens in history is someone sometimes tricky. Um, because there are two versions of this next story. One version says that Watt Tyler is talking to the king. He is, you know, they're coming to some kind of agreement when up rides the mayor of London with a great big sword and kills Watt Tyler for no particular reason other than he doesn't like him. Okay, so that's one version. The other version is that what Tyler goes up to the king and starts shouting at him and he spits on the floor. He then reaches to get his own sword out, potentially to kill the king. And at that point, the Lord Mayor of London jumps on him and stabs him to death. Now, we don't honestly know which is which. Um, the mayor, obviously, said that he was trying to attack the king. Other people that were watching at the time, including some French knights, said that, that he was not trying to kill the king. He was actually having quite a nice, sensible conversation. We will never know for sure. But yes, one thing led to the other, and stabby, stabby, 
what Tyler is dead. Now at this point, the crowd could have gone absolutely crazy. They've just seen their leader killed. Um, and, but the king, King Richard, he's only 14, remember, at this point. He rides out to the crowd right in front of them in the line of danger, and he calms them all down. He says, no, no, no. Oh, well, what Tyler is dead. I'm sorry. You know, we've made a mistake. Please go back to your homes. We will make sure that everything is fine, and we will reduce the taxes, and oh, what a sad day this is. And whatever he said, however he said it, it worked, and the crowd goes home. And Richard has managed to bring, bring peace to England. Hooray! Well done, teenage king. Super king! So, looking pretty good, isn't it? Until we then fast forward a few months when Richard decides to send out his men, round up the leaders of the peasants, and have them all hanged in a horrible, miserable display of hangings. Um, and, oh, he doesn't make the taxes any better. Instead, he keeps hiring them. Oh, dear. So, he's supposed to have bought peace. He ends up bringing a lot of death like these kings will do but we can still see that Richard is the kind of guy who in a pinch you know when he's when he's in a highly pressurized situation he is very brave but he did get his revenge on those peasant leaders hmm. now the peasant result revolt then doesn't succeed um, but that's not the only revolt that King Richard is gonna have to deal with because King Richard, he's kind of, he gets, uh, he, he's difficult to pin down like lots of these kings are, but he gets the reputation of being someone who, even though he's at war with France for his entire reign, he starts to bring a bit of peace. You know, there, there, there are breaks, you know, the, the Hundred Years' War goes for 116 years and people aren't, you know, for 116 years without stop knocking each other over the top of the back of the head with a mace or whatever there, there are times of peace in between and so Richard presides over a relatively peaceful time he comes to agreements with the French um, you know we won't fight here we won't fight today we'll build up our forces all this kind of stuff um, uh, ooh, why are there two kings in the picture that's an interesting question I, uh, in this picture here we're talking there is only one king I think uh -huh. Let me see oh no I see what you mean yes because this is this is King Richard uh, with the killing of Wat Tyler, and then this is oh, hang on, uh, this is King Richard afterwards talking to the crowd. Um, back in medieval art, this is you know they're showing the same character. It's kind of you've got to think of it like a comic strip, but um, they just put them all on the same page. If that makes sense. So if you imagine a comic strip without separate boxes, um, that's where we're going here. So this is, you know, one moment he is watching the death of Wad Tyler. The next moment he is turning around and talking to the angry peasants and everything works out fine. Yes, but yeah, well spotted. <laughs> I thought, no, are there double kings? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, um, oh, let me see. Some people are having sound difficulties. Let me pause for a second, see if I can fix that. There we go. Hopefully that helps. Um, um, if you do have sound problems, I, nothing I can say is going to help you because you can't hear me. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so Richard, yeah, he goes down in history as being one of these kings who is he likes a bit of peace. Yeah, he's not he's definitely not a warlord like his grandfathers or his father. Uh, sorry, his grandfather or his great grandfather. Uh, we can have a look at his family tree here, which will become important in a second. Usually I don't show specific family trees, but I think today it's kind of a, kind of important. So if you remember, last time we looked at Edward III, the King of England, who started the Hundred Years' War, my favourite king in history for sure. Hmm. Now he had a son, Edward of Woodstock, the Black Prince, ha -ha, who unfortunately pooed himself to death. His son is Richard. So Richard is the grandson of Edward III. But there's lots of other family around here. Edward had lots of different children. So he had Edward and Lionel and John and Edmund and Thomas. Hmm. Um, uh, we will get to Richard III, <laughs> but not yet. Richard II comes before Richard III. Um, now, Richard isn't like his dad, the Black Prince, who was like super warlord, or like Edward III, who is like super warlord. Instead, he wants to surround himself with art 
and literature and culture. During his time, he has loads of paintings painted. He buys a lot of jewellery. He gives money to important writers like Chaucer, who is one of the most uh, famous writers in the English language, especially before Shakespeare who wrote A Canterbury Tale. Um, he spent a lot of money on very expensive, fine clothes, and he, he builds these beautiful buildings all over the place because uh, that's what he cares about. He doesn't care about war. He, care, he, he cares about uh, beautiful things and expensive things, um, which upsets a few people, to be sure. Um, you know, people like peaceful stuff, I guess. You know, the people weren't unhappy that he was being peaceful. But they were unhappy that even when Richard sort of starts to make peace with France, so the whole Hundred Years' War thing starts to die down a little bit and become more peaceful, everyone thought, well, now he'll put the taxes down because we were only paying loads of taxes because we had to keep paying soldiers to fight the French. Surely now we're not doing that so much, we can have lower taxes. But this didn't happen the taxes kept on going up. And where was all the money going? On the art and the buildings and the posh clothes and the really nice crown for his wife and all this kind of stuff. Um, but um, unfortunately, this just made people angry. Um, and we're not talking the peasants anymore so much. Um, we're talking uh, the other nobles in the country, the other rich people. Yeah leave that there for a second um oh, let me just go back to a couple of questions in the chat here um when did arthur become king we haven't had a king arthur yet i'm afraid um maybe one day and there, there's a, a fictional a mythical arthur isn't there but uh, i don't think we've had one on the books properly um uh, oh i don't know who his wife is queen someone of somewhere else <laughs> uh and no, I haven't mentioned how he dies yet. We'll come to that, yes. Um, so he's upsetting the nobles. Um, oh, um, uh, Becca's asking, how do these peasants have armour? They would have done, they would have, you know, maybe they probably wouldn't have looked quite so well armoured as these guys. But in medieval times, there's no such thing as an army. So the king doesn't have his own army of, of people who he trains and puts in uniform. Um, at times of great problems if there's a, a battle that needs to be fought you go to the peasants and you say peasants time to fight guys get your armor get your swords let's go and so in a and in your average peasant village there would have been quite a bit of armor knocking around and quite a few weapons um because these guys would have been ready to fight um which means they're quite dangerous if you think about it hmm, yeah um so uh, he's upsetting the nobles. The taxes are going up and he's spending it all on bling, essentially. Now, whilst he's doing this, um, the nobles also start to dislike him too, because most kings, what they do is there's the king at the top of the pile, and then there are loads of lords and barons and bishops underneath them. And, you know, he keeps friends with all of them and gives them all equal power. Richard didn't do this. Richard had a very small group of friends who he gave all the power to. Um, these friends came from Cheshire. Um, I don't know if that's relevant, but you know, he, he, there was this small noble group of people from Cheshire who were his best friends. And so they got all the good jobs and they were the ones that were you know, benefiting from all this art and culture. And the rest of the nobles kind of got left out. Um, it was seen as a bit unfair on their, on their part. They're having to pay lots of taxes, plus... Uh, Richard isn't really sharing any of the of the benefit from their taxes with them. You know, they've just got to watch him swallowing about with his special group of friends, and they feel very left out, um, as you can imagine. So, Richard is uh, attacked by the barons and the lords. A civil war is going to begin. Um, hang on, I'm being told that people are freezing. Let me see if I can fix it again. That may help, may help. Um, so, it all comes to a head when Richard's cousin, we can see him here, Henry, decides that he is going to lead a group of barons and they are going to put an end 
to this terrible king, this terrible king who cares about art and poetry and stuff, and has a group of friends from Cheshire and is ignoring all the other nobles. And so at first, Henry uh, captures um, Richard and he promises, oh, we're getting a lot of people with uh, visual is issues here, hang on. He makes Richard promise that Henry can be king instead. So he basically takes the crown from Richard. Now Richard bows down to Henry because he doesn't have much choice and he gives um, Henry the crown. But then Henry takes Richard and puts him into prison. Now, a slow and painful death is on, uh, is there for Richard because poor old Richard, he's left there in prison. He's not given any food or water and he starves slowly to death. Oh dear. And that is the end of Richard II, killed by his own uncle, uh, or his own cousin, sorry, put into prison and starved there. Ooh. Um, now, I've got a lot of people saying that my screen isn't working. Let me see if I can fix it one more time. Uh, let's go like that. Ah, you can hear me. That's interesting. Okay. I can see myself, but I cannot see, uh, but you obviously cannot see me. I'll see if I can start again. There we are. That might help. Ah, there you go. <laughs> okay. So, um, yes, yeah, so it's Henry who puts Richard in prison, and Henry then becomes Henry the Fourth, King of England. Huzzah! So, goodbye, Richard. Hello, Henry. Now, the first thing that we need to know about Henry, well, I suppose the first thing we need to know about Henry is that he starves his cousin to death um, and takes the crown from him. So, it's not the best way to become king, let's put it that way. Um, uh, Another good thing about Henry, though, is that he's the first king of England to naturally speak English. Um, I think probably Richard would have been able to speak some English, um, but his first language was still French. Um, Henry IV is the first king of England whose first language is English. He has spoken English since he, grew, he, since he was born to now. Um, and that might be because he's not in the noble families. Well, he is in the noble families, but he's not in the royal family. He was never supposed to become king. If he hadn't attacked King Richard and starved him to death in a prison, he would never have been king. And this plays on his mind a lot, as you can imagine. He feels like, quite rightfully, he feels like he's stolen it um, because he has. <gasps> so um, he is noble, but he's not particularly royal. And his surname, he, the house that he comes from, is the House of Lancaster. Now, he has cousins and uncles and things from another part of the family called the House of York. And not right now, not under Henry, but in the future, the houses of Lancaster and York are going to have a serious falling out with something called the Wars of the Roses. Now, if you look here, we've got John, Duke of Lancaster, who is... Uh, Edward's son and we've got Edmund the Duke of York who is also Edward's son and we're going to when we get to the War of the Roses which will be in a couple of weeks time we'll see how these two different houses these two families Lancaster and York really do uh, start to go crazy with each other and Henry the fourth is really where this we could blame this maybe this this coming war on him just for taking over the throne it really, the throne should not belong to Lancaster or York. It should stay with the Plantagenets. But with the death of Richard uh, II, that's the last of the Plantagenet kings gone. We're into a new dynasty now, um, the House of Lancaster. Ooh. Um, do you hear me? I'm not sure what's going on with my video, guys. Sorry that I, I seem to be freezing for a lot of people. Um, I'm afraid you're just going to have to, I can't really do much about it. So you might just have to uh, listen to this one instead. Uh, I can see myself fine on my screen. So I'm guessing the recording will come out all right. Um, yeah, but sorry about that. You, you'll just have to listen to the audio for this one, I guess. Hmm. You're a bit lame, I know. Um, so Henry kills, his, uh, kills the previous king. Then... He, we know that he's the first king to speak English, which makes him a bit of a hero in history, I suppose, because from here on out, our kings are not going to be speaking French. They're going to know French for a long, long time. Um, you know, 
Queen Elizabeth, for example, who we'll talk about in a, in a while, um, she can speak French, Italian, Latin, Greek, um, and English, of course. So, you know, uh, the, the kings and queens will still learn French for a long, long time. But this is the first king to naturally speak English as his first language. Now, unfortunately for Henry, he's not a very popular king. He never goes on anyone's lists of like best kings of England or even particularly most interesting kings of England. He's not king for long. He only lasts for 14 years or just under 14 years. Um, so, you know, it's not great. He, he hasn't got a great fabled reign. He's mostly famous for the way he becomes king and, and, and some problems that he had during it. And the biggest problem that Henry IV had was from the Welsh. Ooh. Now, um, if we go back and if we think about uh, Edward I, the Hammer of the Scots, okay, um, he had gone into Wales and he had conquered the place and he had built his ring of iron, um, his great big set of castles all the way through Wales. And since that day, the Welsh had been pretty quiet. Um, you know, they, they're under the same laws as England. In most examples, they are sort of part of England. They have their own noble royal families. And um, one of those noble families during the reign of Henry IV is controlled by Owen Glyndere, which I've probably said terribly wrong. Um, my Welsh is not great. Um, but there you go. Let's see. Owen Glyndere, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, Owen, he's in his castle in Wales, and he looks out and he sees how troubled, I suppose, England is. You know, they're at war with France. They've still got, they're still holding back the uh, Scots up in the north. Uh, the king has been taken and starved to death. This new guy has shown up who doesn't seem to be particularly well experienced in kingship. You know, not like the other guy who's been doing it since he was 10. And I think Owen thinks, now is the time. Let's get some Welsh independence. Let's push all those terrible English people. Get them out of here. Yeah, can't be living in Wales. That's where I live. I'm Owen Glindwe Glindower. All right, then Glindower. We'll go with that. Thank you, Eleanor. Yes, yeah, so it's like Glindower, Owen Glindower. Ooh. Now, he starts to cause a lot of problems. He starts to raise small armies and to fight back against the English. He even takes down a couple of Welsh castles, well, English castles in Wales, and he starts to cause a serious threat. Now, Henry then is forced into what essentially becomes a bit of a full-scale war against Wales, um, the first that's been since, seen since the time of Edward I, his great-great-great-grandfather. Um, now, uh, oh, why is he called Henry? That's a good question. Um, I, I believe he's called Henry because he comes from the royal line. And so, you know, it's a very popular name. Henry, Edward, both, uh, and William, both pretty, and Richard, pretty, pretty uh, popular names back then. So, yeah. Um, but Owen, he is causing these problems and he's really hard to pin down. Um, the English army is going to keep going into Wales. Sometimes they get beaten. Often they beat the Welsh, but it never actually achieves anything. Owen himself always disappears away in the battle. Now I've got a picture of Owen Glyndower here. Here he is. These are his colours. You'll notice that, um, I mean this is an artist representation, but the colours are perfect. Um, it's not like this Welsh guy is looking particularly different from the English or the French knights, as you can tell. He would have had uh, his colours and his symbol were the lion and the red and the yellow. Um, he would have dressed like a knight. He probably would have been completely fluent in French because uh, he is a nobleman after all, but he still has that Welsh heritage as well. Um, and he definitely saw himself, considered himself as Welsh rather than English for sure. So he's bringing up this rebellion against, uh, here we go. He's bringing up this hopefully that's better, um, against uh, the English. And it's causing Henry real problems. Um, in fact, Henry would love to you know, beat Owen up and put him in prison and execute him, but he never gets the chance. In fact, after years of fighting, by about 1412, so nearly the end of Henry's reign, when Henry himself is quite ill by this point, um, Owen just disappears. 
No one knows to this day where Owen went. Um, it's, a, it's thought that he probably disguised himself and went and lived somewhere else. I mean, he never did defeat the English, but he also never get, got caught, which makes him a bit of a Welsh hero, of course. Um, uh, because he just fades away. Now, there's all kinds of rumours and speculation about what happened to this, this hero of Wales who tried to fight back against England. Some people say he just died and, you know, people will maybe buried him in a secret place but that's not a very exciting idea um a lot of people think that he dressed up as a monk and went to live uh as a servant or as a tutor to one of his uh, relatives and just pretended to be a monk for the rest of his life which kind of has some uh it could well be true because at this point uh Owen was famous during the war against England. He was famous for disguising himself and using trickery. So he would like dress up as someone else. He'd dress up as a peasant and appear at the back, you know, behind you during a battle or something. Um, so it could well be that he just, you know, he liked dressing up and so he pretended to be a monk for the rest of his life. Um, uh, someone's telling me here that he died from the bubonic plague. Maybe, I suppose. <laughs> a bit of a return of the plague came back. Yes. Um, <laughs> ah, good, though. Thank you. Um, oh dear, hot chocolate and cake. That's not healthy for a dog. I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, uh, so yes, it could be, it could be the Black Death. It's an interesting, you know, uh, if you talk to the Welsh people, they might say that, you know, he went and he died a hero somewhere in quiet away from the English. If you talk to the English, they might say that, yeah, he just died of the plague or something, or we killed him, but there's no evidence for anything. That's the wonderful thing. So Owen Glendire, he's maybe... Maybe he's there waiting in Wales. He'd be very old right now, but maybe he's waiting to attack England again and take it down in the name of the dragon. Rawr. Yes. Um, oh, I don't know how old he was. I don't know. I, I can have a look for you in a bit. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, Owen Gl Glyndower, his uh, relationship with Henry was pretty common, really. His own barons didn't really like him. Uh, the people of England didn't really like him. During his reign, things were quite unsettled. Uh, you know, the Hundred Years' War is still going on. And Henry's, he's the kind of guy who's, who's quite harsh, you know. He, he really does push the Welsh to rebellion because he's so harsh to them. He's like, you know, give me extra taxes. You need to do this. You need to do that. Um, you're not going to do things your own way. You know, we're going to make you more English, whether you like it or not. And of course, Owen Glendower decided not. Um, uh, there were a sizable amount of nobles who started to spread a rumour that the dead King Richard, the young king who was starved to death in the dungeon, that he never really died at all, that actually he escaped, and he's waiting in France, or he's waiting in Scotland, or he's waiting in Wales, or he's waiting under that bush over there. And so Henry's constantly got to deal with people who are telling him, the king's not dead, you're not the real king. This makes him really upset, as you can imagine, because um, he, he had to go through a whole... A uh, whole war, and then he had to go and, you know, kill his own relative to take the crown. And he's putting in all that effort. Now everyone's telling him he's not true. Must have been very upsetting for the poor man. Um, so he's got that to deal with. He also, early in his reign, um, a bishop, uh, one of the members of the church, a very holy man, tries to get rid of him. He tries to lead a plot against the king. And in revenge, Henry has him br brutally executed kills this holy man which is not done in medieval times you don't kill the holy people yeah that's a bad idea and everyone says oh oh he's cursed now he's gone and killed a bishop he's oh he did it in a nasty way as well oh, he's gonna be cursed he's gonna be cursed so henry spends a lot of his time going down to canterbury behind me is the cathedral um because he wants to try and he, he becomes very religious he wants to try and make up for this terrible crime of killing the bishop. And so he associates himself with Thomas a Becket, the guy who was killed by Henry II. Um, if you remember, Henry II, the angry king, um, he had killed the Archbishop of Canterbury by sending four knights into the cathedral, and there they stabbed Thomas Becket to death. Um, 
Henry the Fourth spends a lot of time at Thomas Becket's grave praying and uh, worshipping Thomas, or at least worshipping God through Thomas, in an attempt to try and save his own soul and to make people, you know, forgive him more and to see to show that he is holy and uh, proper and okay and he he should be the king. I should be the king. It's legitimate. I promise. Um, unfortunately, everyone mutters and they say, "Oh no, you killed a bishop." doesn't matter how much praying you do sir you are going to suffer and it does seem that that suffering starts not long after um henry he gets a weird skin problem we're not sure what it is exactly it could be leprosy um so bits of him might just start falling off you know with, with leprosy your skin can go quite bad or at least the old version of leprosy where how that relates to our modern leprosy is a bit tricky because this is medieval speak we're talking here um but yes his skin starts to go bad um bits of him might start to drop off and he seems to start having these fits or attacks again it's hard to tell some people have said maybe he developed epilepsy and was having having epileptic seizures um it might just be some other condition you know uh but whatever it was he would have these periods where he would just you know fall to the floor be in great pain screaming and kicking and writhing around and he wouldn't be able to do anything for a few days or a few weeks um well we're talking more extreme than acne we're talking yeah his skin peeling off that kind of thing and of course doctors aren't great back then in the medieval period so most people are looking at the king's illness and they're saying shouldn't have killed a priest you've been cursed look your face is falling off mate you shouldn't do it bad king bad so ooh, 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 indeed um so poor henry towards the end of his reign and you can see he doesn't reign for long he he dies when he's only 46 years old um uh he's he spends the, the the end of his reign having these fits and attacks whatever they are uh having these severe skin problems and nobody's very sympathetic there's the people you know the welsh don't care they're really angry at him um because of the whole owen glendare thing or glendower um we've got the nobles who don't like him and most of them are trying to pretend that richard is still alive we've got the church doesn't like him because of what he did to the bishop and that doesn't really leave many people left to like him the peasants aren't happy with him because he doesn't lower taxes or anything so by the time he does die he's you know not particularly missed um he dies as a result of his illness in some way um you know maybe has a particularly large fit and just you know dies we, we don't really know it's it's so hard to tell with these medieval uh, ideas there are lots of historians who look at the illnesses of of the of the dead kings and try and work out exactly what was wrong with them um in this case who knows um but whatever it was it did kill him which was good news uh, especially for wales because the next king to come along and the one that we're going to talk about next time is henry v and then henry the sixth who that's going to take our focus back to france you know our two kings today we've got to kind of imagine the hundred years war rumbling along in the background henry v is going to ride out to france with an army and he is going to score some impressive victories especially at the battle of Agincourt. um whereas henry the sixth is going to well he's gonna be an interesting guy so i'll save him for next time um but just to to focus on just to go back to uh, Richard for a second here, if we're talking about doctors and how difficult it is to work out deaths and things, um, there was another problem with Richard uh, insofar as he seems to have had some kind of mental disorder going on. No one's quite sure what, and no one's exactly sure that he did, but it seems that towards, his, towards the end of his life, people kept commenting how he was losing his marbles or losing his memory or his mind, or he was, wasn't quite himself and he was, you know, doing crazy things. Now, whether this is true and he was actually losing his mind um, or whether it's just something that, you know, his wicked uh, successor Henry the fourth was spreading maybe that was just his excuse for capturing the king and putting him in prison you know this man is mad we must lock him away and not feed him that'll make him better <laughs> twirly mustache moment um I don't know but so he, he could have had medical problems he might not have had medical problems we just don't know unfortunately hmm. 
Um, so uh, I, I can see some people are putting some stars in the chat there. So I'd like to see what your star ratings are. Um, but there's a good question uh, here from Asma. Uh, who do you like more out of Richard and Henry the um, first? And you like, you like, oh, sorry, out of Henry, you like Richard more. Yes, I think I like Richard more, but not neither of these kings are particularly impressive, I, I'm afraid. You know, they're no Edward the Thirds. Luckily, next week, we're going to see some pretty cool kings. Yeah. Uh, I personally very much like Henry the Sixth in particular. Henry the Fifth is cool, but maybe not nice. Henry the, Henry the Sixth tends to be a nice guy, but we'll see. Uh, oh, so we're getting, let's, let's read out some star ratings here. We've got a few two stars, a few one stars. Uh, oh, yes, one from Polar there. Minus five from Grace, minus seven from Thomas. Um, oh, Richard gets an eight from Heidi. That's pretty cool. Okay, so we like Richard. Um, oh, there's a lot of zero stars. All oh, your harsh critics of these kings. Um, it seems like, from the numbers we're getting here, that uh, Henry is not as popular as Richard. Um, I mean, I do feel a bit sorry for Henry. No one really liked him, but that kind of was because he wasn't very nice. You know, it's a hard one, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure when he took over the kingdom and starved uh, Richard to death, I'm sure he thought he was doing the right thing. Maybe. Maybe he thought he was saving England from a stupid or potentially mad king. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, in a Galaxy 10 UK, I, I, can't, I have to end the, the call because otherwise my recording goes funny. Um, so I can't leave it open, I'm afraid. Um, all right. Uh, right. We'll leave it there for today, guys. Thank you very much. Next week, we've got uh, Henry V and Henry VI. And I think that yeah, you, you, you might like them a bit more. Um, tomorrow, we're going to Greece um, in geography for G. Uh, on Wednesday, where are we going? Oh, we're going to see the Mycenaeans, so some ancient Greeks. And on Friday, we're wrapping up with the Odyssey, a great tale of another person leaving Troy uh, on his way home to Greece this time instead of Italy. So, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all um, in other lessons this week and have a wonderful day. Adios.